All right, hello everyone and welcome to the Ventures Podcast. I'm excited to share this recording of a uh, panel that Joel, Greg, Mike, and I did on March 7th on the Internet of Places. We talk about Web3, we talk about the merging of digital and physical, we talk about how the built environment and the design is going to intersect with uh, various different identities of things and people. So if you're listening to this episode, you can watch it uh, by visiting the link in the show notes, or if you're watching, you can listen. Uh, wherever you get your podcast, you can search for Ventures and it should show up. So with that, please enjoy this panel discussion with Joel Ferris, Greg Gallimore, Mike Anderson, and me. Cheers. Thank you all for joining us for the Internet of Places. Uh, really excited to have this conversation and explore this topic with uh, the panelists here today. And the intention of this conversation is not necessarily to get to answers or solutions that are going to be immediately actionable, but really to frame the opportunities and to strike that match, so to speak. We want to spark the next question or, or the opportunity or that chain reaction in which you're able to connect disparate ideas and thoughts together to encounter a new idea, right? Something that's maybe an idea that you are not familiar with or a technology you haven't heard about or a use case that you want to lean into more. So that's the intention of this conversation. And with that, I'm gonna do a round of intros real quick and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll dive in. So uh, first we've got Greg Gallimore here. Uh, Greg is a principal and Northwest Director of Digital Experience Design at Ginsler. Uh, he's leading a lot of Ginsler's innovation and in the application of technology, not only to human experience, but also to the operational side of the built environment. So welcome, Greg. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, we've also got Mike Anderson. Uh, Mike is head of Proto Labs and also co-founder of Alfie. Uh, he's also a early adopter and builder of decentralized autonomous organizations. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of really interesting things there talking about DAOs and NFTs and other uh, acronyms. Welcome, Mike. Thanks for having me. Good to have you. And Will Little, serial entrepreneur extraordinaire, uh, as well as founder and managing partner of Proto Ventures, uh, where you invest in a mentor founders, but focus, you've been focusing on Web3 specifically uh, for the last few years. So glad to have you, Will. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. So Will, you and I started a conversation uh, a while back uh, in speaking about the network state, right? The, the book that uh, Baraji uh, published talking about how emerging and specifically Web3 technologies are really redefining the ways that people are coming together and connecting, forming communities, uh, aggregating power and decision-making, uh, even to the extent that they could gain diplomatic recognition, right? As a completely virtual uh, entity. Uh, and so we started talking about the disruption that new emerging technologies are having on where and how and when people gather, right? What does that even mean? And this led to talking about the, you know, uh, built environment and the places that we work and the places that we eat and the places that we live. And there's also the pure virtual environments, right? Where we have the metaverse and a lot of hype around that in the last couple of years. And there's this overlap in the middle where there's physical and digital, right? Where the internet is meeting the environment. And that overlap seems to be getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so, of course, today, you know, the internet is becoming almost inextricable from the built environment, right? Our buildings have become smart. Uh, we've got things like, you know, data collection and intelligence uh, that we're talking about user experiences in the built environment. We're talking about haptics in, in spaces and places. Um, digital mediums are now as common as glass and, and steel and concrete. Uh, and so there's all sorts of new combinations and ways that we're thinking about human experience in the environment. Uh, we're also thinking about internet mediated communication, right? Where physical proximity is actually no longer a precondition for access to knowledge and information and people. And then the Web3 community is talking about you know, mirror land or, you know, the virtual twins of an entire landscapes and cities and NFT clones of physical objects, which we'll get into. So there's a lot of language here that's new to us. And there's a lot of technologies that are new to us. And so maybe, Will, if you could start by uh, maybe defining what Web3 is in general and, and how we should understand Web3 before we get into talking about its implications for the built environment. 
Yeah, sure. So if you ask 100 people what Web3 is, you're, you're going to get 100 different answers. Uh, I want to give three definitions. The first definition is just, it's just a better internet. It's a bunch of people trying to make a better internet. Like that's that's kind of it in a nutshell. The slightly more sophisticated answer is, is the second definition I'll give is that in the same way that Web 1.0, all the, the networking and different protocols that were originally set up so that you can put information up, right? So there was a technology that allowed putting information on the internet. That was Web 1.0. Web 2.0 was really ushered in by the advent of relational databases that allowed you to then write onto the internet and create things like MySpace and Twitter and Facebook and all these things. Uh, and then Web 3.0 with the advent of blockchains allow you to create actual ownership of digital assets, different types of tokens and things that we'll talk about a bunch that Joel had already mentioned earlier in, in, in the tee up here. And so that's essentially read uh, uh, Web3, the second definition, which was summarized extremely succinctly by Ishida. She basically said, Web1, read. Web2, read, write. And Web3, read, write, own. And so the final definition I'll give, this is more for maybe the bottom up thinkers out there. It's really eight or nine competing narratives or, or parallel narratives from blockchains and distributed ledger technology to decentralized autonomous organizations, to NFTs, different types of tokens, the self-hosted movement, basically people trying to take their own hardware into their own, into their own spaces in their own properties, um, the metaverse, uh, the semantic web, like people, the semantic web movement 20 years ago, were calling themselves Web 3.0 as a way of like machines talking to each other. Um, so there's a bunch of different parallel narratives that are, I'd say, collectively under the umbrella of Web 3 that is essentially, in a nutshell, trying to make a better internet. Right. Thanks, Will. Greg, what have you been seeing in this space in terms of how some of these technologies are beginning to shape? the environment and and if you have any examples of stuff you're working on that would help us understand this intersection that'd be awesome too yeah i i think will's definition is quite great especially the last one where these all these different technologies are coming together and coming to head to really make um experiences be more rich for people um to think about it from an architectural or or um, a physical design perspective we we're seeing technologies that impact both the performance of spaces that we're creating. How do we operate uh, portfolios of, of different um, campuses together and see them in one um, twinned environment that's fully digital? Do we scan all the spaces and see how they're working? We have sensors in those spaces that then kind of go onto a platform like a metaverse or what we prefer to call virtual worlds right now, where we're creating these spaces that either mirror our physical world or become their own construct of a world that you explore for different uses um, and, and see how they are really impacting people. What are the different communities that we can build in a workplace um, or for a sports team or a variety of different contexts? How do we bring people together and, and think about technology more spatialized? You know, we like, like, Will was saying Web 2.0 is kind of the read-write internet. It's basically uh, an interactive newspaper that's on an infinite scroll going by your screen. How do we push beyond that and, and create a more um, emotive experience, a more immersive experience that allows us to really kind of feel things in digital space? Um, so, And there's a lot of different ways that we use that in, in workplaces or living spaces or you know, hotels, hospitality, um, you know, to, to give that sense of ownership. How, do, how does an employee of a company own a digital token on your campus that only you own, but you have some affinity for? How is there a community and culture building around the idea that there is a, a digital overlay to our physical environment? Much like you have Yelp food reviews and there's a community and, you know, you want to you want to contribute to like this, the greater, you know, collective consciousness of how good a restaurant is. You might be applying that to a corporate campus as well and engaging people in new ways. And then when you tokenize it, you that employee can own that piece of the of the campus or 
some Easter egg that they found in a virtual scavenger hunt on their, their campus to really express and pull people together in new ways. So that's kind of on the experience side, some of the things and experiments that we're doing. And a lot of that happens through AR, augmented reality technology. How do we use our technology to have a new lens, a data overlay onto our physical environment? Um, and then the other side of that, you know, how do we think about VR, the virtual reality, completely having experiences in virtual spaces um, that allow us new abilities? They're usually more focused activities. I know probably people on the call too um, might not enjoy VR. Only 40% 40, 40 of people get nauseous in the first five minutes of doing VR experiences. So we have to really think about how we focus activities in VR and do fully, you know, um, uh, experiences that have particular outcomes. How do we get deep into content? How do we provide people experimentation or product development using VR in different ways? We're building digital twins of entire corporate campuses in VR on game engine technology that's fully social, fully integrated with real data points that are that are being reported in real time. So you can see actually the experiences of places in VR, not just you know constructions of the models themselves, not just a digital twin of a building, but how are people using it? How are people going through it? We have sensor deployments. Um, some of our industrial clients, we have GPS trackers on the trucks. We know where they're going. We know the direction. And then you can go into this virtual world and see the operations of entire companies happening in a digital twin environment. This cuts down on travel costs, reduces carbon footprint, allows us to learn and practice. One of the best use cases for this technology is learning, wellness, well-being, mental health. All of these things come together, and we can do more and, and connect better, learn how to do things, prepare before we actually go on that first day to your new office location. You can practice it um, in a virtual environment before you actually go do the real thing. So we see a multitude of use cases using this technology that are improving outcomes for employees, um, creating better value for um, companies and firms, and, and really making a more hospitable, uh, inclusive experience that everybody can participate in. Um, that's really the, the value proposition and what we see um, incorporating Web3 technologies into built environment and, and real life human experiences um, across all the industries in which we work. Yeah, that's super fascinating. I have a ton of questions, but before I come back to that, I want to go to Mike real quick. Mike, you've been working at the frontier of a lot of these technologies for a long time. What are you seeing on the horizon in terms of what's next and where some of these things and the use cases that Greg may be speaking to, what clues are they giving us in regard to what might be farther down the road? Yeah, absolutely. So we're at this really interesting uh, inflection point of history, right? Like we've never seen anything like this where all these technologies are coming together at once. Mm -hmm. And so just in the last 10 years, our technology has moved from being a screen uh, that's away from us, maybe in the corner of a living room or something like that, to we now bring a supercomputer with us everywhere that we go that has data uplink that's faster than we could ever use. And it's getting closer and closer to us. So like my earbuds, right? Like this is a business that we think of as just being part of Apple, but if it was its own standalone company, it would be one of the biggest companies in Silicon Valley. That's taking on our ears, right? Our phone is kind of like our hand and our touch with a little bit of our vision, but pretty soon that's going to be coming right over the top and we're going to have complete AR uh, senses. Um, and you were talking about haptics. Haptic, haptics are our feeling, our touch. And I just read today uh, that now for smell and taste, uh, they've now been able to create bio microfilaments that interface digitally uh, for taste. And so now we're in a space with uh, the entire way that the human experiences the world is now having a layer of digital over the top of them. And so that's coming, that's coming in and it's also starting to go out. And so then we have, we've got humans, right? We've got environments. And then we've got like all the stories that we make up that help us interact. We've got money, we've got property, we've got laws. These are all things that are abstract concepts that, that are actually becoming digital at the same time because we're tokenizing them. So like, if you think about your social security card or your check, you write a check, you're just publicly throwing a bunch of numbers out there that represent all of you. Well, now you get to keep some of those numbers private and be able to prove that that's you still. And so now you can own something digitally and physically at the same time, and you can prove that you're the one that owns it. 
And they're expecting that over the next five to seven years, around $19 trillion of assets are going to be tokenized. 19 trillion, just to think about how big of a number that is. And so this is like, this is probably like when I was in college in 2002, uh, like social media was just like this thing that maybe you checked every once in a while. And now it's like part of your life, like digital assets and, and uh, are, are going to become part of every transaction that you do. Um, and, and you were talking, Greg, you were talking about how mapping the, the full 3D space, that transaction might be a, a conversation with somebody that you have in a hallway that an AI is watching and understanding how relationships are taking place. Who are the connectors who are like that stuff's all coming. There's a ton of ethical questions around it. And I think that uh, it's, it's unlikely that we're going to work out all those ethical questions at the speed of change. And so um, uh, we're just we're headed into some interesting uh, places very quickly. Yeah, that's super fascinating. I mean, Greg was talking about using tokens on a on a corporate campus, but how do you imagine tokens being used? For example, uh, proof of attendance protocols, right? POAPs. Um, how do you imagine some of these technologies being used today? In what might people who are either landlords or developers or otherwise architects and designers? be thinking about as they're thinking about their environments and how they could activate new experiences or elevate experience uh, in these environments using some of these technologies. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, you know, some just simple real world examples is like Ticketmaster looked at the problem of how do we deal with all these tickets being bought, sold, exchanged. Th those are all on the blockchain at this point in time. They don't talk about it because it's invisible. Um, but it helps solve a lot of problems with like, like I just think about like visitors badges, access, all, all sorts of um, all sorts of how you enable different people, how you do security around a building. These are all things that are going to be tokenized. Um, the identity of the people is going to be tokenized. Um, and that can also that can increase privacy in some instances too, if privacy is designed into it, because it can allow you to be able to um, to understand behaviors without necessarily like drilling down into the individual. And so I think it's, I think there's, a th things are changing so fast, but I think that that the idea of privacy and the idea of I'm not being watched is probably going to become a very valuable thing and a very rare thing. Um, and being able to offer some idea that when I'm here, I am safe, I am private, uh, this information isn't going out. Like these are all problems that are gonna need to be solved. Yeah. Can you explain the difference between a token and cryptocurrency? Because I think a lot of folks aren't sure quite what the difference is. Sure. Yeah. So um, a token is a concept that underlies cryptocurrency. So you can basically think about it like um, it is a way of proving, like I can show you a number that proves that I hold my private number. Is kind of a way to say it, right? So I can prove who I am. I can prove that I own an asset um, because I can demonstrate by showing a number that's not my number, but we use cryptography to understand that, yes, that person does own it because it's a public key. And so uh, you're able to tokenize an object by because there's a blockchain, there's a whole bunch of tokens. Um, you're able to prove that you own this one. And then the computer is able to trace uh, everything that that represents. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So, uh, Greg, explain the difference between, so folks in the real estate and architecture industry are really familiar with digital twin, right? That's something that we typically think about digital twin as a BIM model, right? A building intelligence model. What's the difference between that and what you're talking about when you say digital twin? Um, what I'm saying is uh, more of the evolution of that initial model. So right now, you know, we have a BIM model that we connect to um, infrastructural data, you know, in typical systems to understand how smart buildings are performing and to be able to tune the system for regularity, you know, for things that don't change. You know, it's really not exciting to look at a digital twin of a building because it's very predictable and it should be predictable. What's not predictable are humans. Um, and how we, you know, create systems that see how humans are experiencing spaces, how we design different elements to enhance productivity or the experience employees have in a space um, to have different kinds of outcomes to mix it up. Uh, you know, you, you get smarter by moving to different cities because you have to remap your life. 
you kind of want to do a little bit of that too in a workplace to keep it interesting. Um, so the the one of the beautiful things about metaverse environments, digital twins, and even a lot of this technology is our ability to understand the past. We have a collection of data. We have anonymized sensors so that we know how people are using space. Um, and then we can use that to predict what we call preferred outcomes. How do we create a preferred future for a particular design and model that and use that to simulate experiences in the future? Um, that's kind of the beauty of like how these technologies really not only transcend space, but also time and allow us to have real-time experiences today um, that are really informed, intelligent, um, predict things in the future and have an amazing repository of information of the past. When we layer the human element, that to me is the evolution of the, the, you know, the, the, the traditional digital twin to be a more experiential twin, um, to be really purposeful and useful for all people. We can have one model, one kind of digital twin world that can be used for many purposes, not just managing buildings, but managing the experiences within those buildings and having a more informed um, you know, set of employees or members or whatever the context that we're built that building is for, or the campus or the space, or that kind of organization that may transcend space for fully remote corporations, of which we work with many. Um, you still have to have connective glue, um, a connected culture, and all of that can happen through a digital landscape that knits people together in new ways. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I think it did. I think it did. Yeah. Um, Mike, you said something really fascinating. You said, you know, things like money and law and property, these are abstract concepts. There's, there's stories that we tell ourselves that we've all collectively and socially kind of ascribed to these narratives that often govern our decision-making and the, the body politic and our social contracts. And that these things are be these stories are being digitized. Um, and I, I think about things like, you know, collaboration, right, which is a physical activity, but it's also uh, an emergent property of interaction, whether physical or otherwise. And so there's like these stories that we tell ourselves about what work is and where it happens and how it happens. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts on how some of those stories are being digitized and what that might mean. Yeah, so what, what comes to mind is there's a, I'm working with a startup right now that is headed towards a series B raise and they need to grow like wild, but I don't live in the same state as them. Um, and I'm getting ready to go see them on Friday uh, across the country. And for us, uh, we're, collab we're used to collaborating through Zoom right now, right? So you can think of Zoom as being the metaverse for work or teams or whatever you wanna use, right? And it's flat, it's, it's not a great experience. It's kind of like Super, Super Mario Brothers, right? Like we know things are gonna get better, um, but this is kind of where we're at. But still today, like when I'm spending time with them in person, we're not doing the same types of work at all, right? Like what, what we're doing is we actually were like, hey, for the time that we're going to be in person, like let's go for an actual walk and let's brainstorm. Let's, let's you know, this, this is some of the like divergent thinking as opposed to convergent thinking, because I don't need to have my blinders on uh, when I'm together with a real human. I want to be thinking about everything that we could do or solving really difficult problems. And so um, I think that uh, like in this space, you have to be adaptive and the building is going to have to be adaptive because work is gonna change faster every year than it probably did in the previous decade. And then that's gonna happen the next year is gonna be more than the previous decade before. And so we're in this space where um, our technology and our buildings are gonna have to work together in order to allow humans to, to do the next thing that we're going to do. Because we're at that stage where like the steam engine got invented and all of a sudden we go from like having full factories of people with looms and stuff to now while well, the, the machine's doing it, we need to like repurpose this space for some new use. And we're gonna have to do that every one to two years now. Mm. Yeah, because the reality. Coming, yeah, because what's coming is I'm gonna have, uh, talk about digital twin, I'm going to be able to train my own avatar to go not just hang out in one virtual mall or park or whatever, but potentially thousands of per virtual malls or, or buildings in, in lots of different metaverses that are, that, are, that are coming. And I'm going to be able to train my avatar with a large language model like ChatGPT has now made it super popular 
on my own writing, my own thoughts, my own things. And, and, and people are going to be able to interact with me in lots of different spaces and lots of different metaverses. Um, hopefully with appropriate copy it's like, Hey, I'm just Will's digital twin. I can't totally speak for him, but here's generally kind of what I think he might say about this particular topic. Um, so uh, the implications for how I might be able to allow my digital twins to do work and collect money across those thousand metaverses. Yeah. Things start getting pretty interesting there. Yeah. I, I love that idea. And we've talked a lot about that, Will. And one of the things I think about often is how these virtual environments actually become part of an amenity strategy for developers and landlords, right? And thinking about the value proposition to a potential tenant in a office environment where you can say, look, not only do you have the physical office here, but you have an infinitely expandable virtual office that comes as a part of your lease agreement, right? That you then have access to via a token that grants you access. And you can create whatever kind of working environment you want to in that world and people can gather and collect there. Uh, and then in fact, are multiple companies now that have adopted a purely meta uh, kind of um, uh, metaverse working environment. They don't even have physical offices. In fact, there's a there's actually a real estate brokerage in the Northwest. They go from Vancouver down to Portland. I believe I'm blanking on the name of them at the moment. They've adopted this model where they have zero office space. They actually have just pure metaverse space. Hmm. And I think what we've seen just in the last few years when it comes to avatars and artificial intelligence, these large language models, um, the way that avatars are being tokenized and the market and the economy that's emerging around avatars in terms of selling clothing for your avatar, right? There's an entire market space now for the design and selling of custom clothing for your avatars and how you personalize and express yourself in a virtual way. Uh, there's a lot happening there. And I think that's that's really fascinating. Um, maybe, you know, we could like expand on that a little bit. This idea that work happens everywhere and that work is being digitized in many ways. And in fact, like Mike, what you were saying earlier about we are, we are, the, it's getting closer to us, right? Like our more and more senses are, are, are being translated into virtual experiences. Uh, and so it's kind of inevitable that that there will be a virtual twin of ourselves working in some virtual environment. But what does that mean for cities? What does that mean for city states or or provinces or states or countries? And you know, going back to the the network state uh, biology um, uh, book, thinking about how you have this highly aligned online community with a capacity, this is his definition, with a capacity for collective action that crowdfunds territory around the world and eventually gains diplomatic recognition from pre-existing states. I mean, do you think we're gonna see an emergent class of businesses that operate like this? And maybe is the is the DAO format an early clue or a primitive form factor of this emerging business type or collective type? Um, open question to all of you. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. I'll go. I think we're in a time kind of like the mid 1700s when the corporate algorithm was invented. Mm -hmm. So when the corporate algorithm was invented, there was kind of, you know, Dutch East India Company put together like, hey, this is how we're going to run things. And a floor of people in London were able to take over the entire continent of India. And then they just kept going. And then basically that system of corporation, uh, the corporate algorithm, beat every king and kingdom that existed and kind of held the power, like almost all of them, right? And in the in its process, it created the legal, the foundation of the legal system that we have, the monetary system we have, the governance system we have. It basically reorganized all of society around making this corporation be able to have a return to the people who hold it. Well, I think that what we're going to see, what we're already starting to see is that DAOs are basically being able to create a programmable, um, a programmable corporation in the sky that is not locked into land. It's not, you know, there's, there's no bounds to it. And it also can move much faster because it's all software. It's not lawyers. It's not precedent. It's what does the code say? And so we're seeing groups of people who can come together. Um, they can have a vision for what they want to see the world look like, and they can fractionalize the upfront investment. 
Um, they also can own from the beginning without any kind of real friction or, or anything like that, um, the ability to then go make that world possible. And there are people from all over the world that are making tools to enable this kind of communication, decision-making, uh, collaboration, rewards. Um, and so I, I would be shocked if in five years, these tools aren't so superior to what's being able to be offered by a centralized group that, that those just win. Like, I mean, you just look at it, right? Like as a society, we're crippled by the fact that we can't make decisions and, and we're not even incentivized to make decisions. And, and so I think that uh, there's gonna find, nature's gonna find its path and I think it's going to happen through a new paradigm of governance. And that's what the network state, state I think will be. And I have no idea how it will play out. <laughs> that's awesome. I love it. Any other thoughts on that, Greg and Will? Well, I, I was just kind of pondering Will's idea of having thousands of bots. And, um, you know, we typically think about exponential growth in terms of a product. But how do we have exponential growth as individuals um, through that kind of impact that we can be many places, uh, like the Michelle Yeoh movie, you know, everything everywhere at once um, is kind of an interesting idea um, to to have a sense of growth because through this, I mean, technology is by nature deflationary. Um, it lowers the cost of things. So how do we generate value? Um, and and really thinking about how to apply that in a in a virtual world sense where there seemingly is no limit, but value is a function of scarcity. Um, so how do we uh, define our limitations? Design works best when you have really great parameters and limitations. Um, art comes from depravity by not having um, that then we have to create. So through this idea of, of these organizations that are infinitely scalable and decentralized, how do we maintain a sense of value um, that is really benefiting humanity are some of the questions that I'd love to explore in the future. I think it's yeah, a really just, question. Go ahead, Will. I was just saying, I just, I got back from ETH Denver just recently here um, and 20,000 people descended on Denver to talk about Web3 and, and I saw lots of teams building protocols around decentralized governance and roles and responsibilities and how to tokenize that and how to just continue to evolve the algorithm of the corporation or the, the algorithm of the, the digital cooperative, which is essentially what these DAOs are. And it makes me wonder, when learning Web3 as a product person, you first have to understand the difference between an application and the underlying protocol, right? In the same way that email was built on top of SMTP and POP3 and IMAP and other protocols, we are now seeing the emergence of new underlying um, interfaces to be able to build applications that can go across lots of different things. For those in the built environment, right? I, haven't, I, I just sort of, I'm wondering, are, are we gonna see something similar where things we own, people we work with, things that experiences that we want to have IRL or in different virtual spaces, or that blend is going to be pretty confusing moving forward. <laughs> I wonder if there, there's an analogous uh, concept here where there's going to be these sort of protocols of interaction in, in built environments, protocols for interaction in, in the internet of spaces that then we can take with us and, and adopt other people's interfaces and other people's applications. No matter no matter where we go, and I think that this is that future is coming very fast, and people are thinking about that from different angles. But maybe Joel to ask you a question, like how do you think about that in in, in terms of where where you see the the the, the digital environment, you know, the digital and physical coming together? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's a really good point. I think that that protocol is actually going to be adopted in the public sector first and thinking about public spaces and community ownership of spaces, as well as a way to negate or undermine things like gentrification and economic, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, essentially folks who are, are economic refugees, right? Because they're priced out of a partic particular community. Mm. I think what you <clears throat> might see happening is what historically have been known as land trusts become DAOs, right? But the protocol for the governance becomes digitized for how land is used. And within a particular proximity of that land, you own 
a token share of that DAO, right? So you have a token that that uh, or a share of tokens that is tied to the value of that land. So you have a stake in how that land is used. And so what happens if someone comes to develop that land, they have to actually develop it in accordance with the protocol of that DAO. And so they have mm -hmm. to do it in a way in which there's a, a particular percentage of that land is given mm -hmm. back to public use. A particular percentage of that land is uh, affordable housing or missing middle housing. In a particular, you know, a particular percentage of that land has to be community-based resources and amenities like local food and restaurants and places to hang and things to do, right? Mm. And that as they invest in that land, it actually invests, it actually increases the value of tokens held by those who belong to that DAO, which is the, the trust. Mm. And so there's a reciprocal incentive to see that place be successful, right? And so the community and the developer both have a stake in ensuring that everyone equitably can belong there and it isn't getting displaced. So I think you're going to start seeing things like that, where the adoption of Web3, uh, specifically blockchain and DAOs, allows you to implement a new governance protocol in community engagement, interaction, and stakeholders that you don't have today, because there's no traditional economic fiscal system to facilitate that kind of engagement or ownership, right? So I think I think those are the kinds of things that you're going to start seeing. Uh, and they're already happening. That's already happening. I think the second thing that you're seeing less of, but we're, what we are still seeing happen already, is not just making a digital twin. Uh, and Mike, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Not just making a digital twin of the built environment, but actually... Uh, um, uh, twinning every piece. <laughs> so what I mean by that is if there's a window that goes into the construction of a new building or a big steel beam or a right name it, that that thing gets cloned digitally. The physical thing actually gets cloned. It's laser engraved with the uh, that number, Mike, that you were talking about earlier, right? That references an actual NFT clone of that thing. And that then those NFTs can go on the NFT market and people can actually buy and sell and trade those NFTs that are representative of the actual physical thing in the building. And so then now you have a community of people who own the digital assets that are tied to a physical place, right? And so now you're connecting digital value to physical value. This is also a new business model that developers could adopt. Not only could they have an amenity strategy that includes a metaverse clone of their physical environment, but they could have a revenue strategy that includes the monetization of NFTs tied to the physical objects in the building itself. And so getting becoming a tenant might give you subsidized access to those NFTs or some other thing, right? There's, again, incentive networks that can be built into that where things like ownership and what you pay in your lease and how long your lease is and how many people are there are all tied to things like tokenization and NFTs. So we're all, again, we're already seeing that happen. Uh, and, but we're just on the cusp of it. Um, Mike, I'm curious what you think about, about some of that. Yeah. I mean, the, the most true like example right now is hotel room booking, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's sometimes a year where a hotel room, you could just show up that day. But there are certain nights like New Year's, certain places at holidays, things like that, where they're really valuable, actually. And so they're starting to uh, sell hotel rooms as NFTs. And what that, what that does then is it puts it on a marketplace where your hotel room can go up in price. Mm. It, can be, it can be traded. It, has a, it could even have automatic market makers where there's algorithms buying and selling these hotel rooms. Uh, the owner of the hotel can now take... 3%, 5%, 10% every time the transaction happens. They've got monetization uh, that way. And that's kind of what Nike did with sneakers, right? And so you think sneakers, like what's a more boring thing than sneakers? And like, no, they literally got tens of thousands of people to be trading back and forth and turning a commodity into a one-of-a-kind asset. And I think the same thing is going to happen um, with buildings. And I think that you know, when you think about like at, at its root, what like a timeshare is or like a lease to own like situation at scale is I can imagine a world in which uh, large apartment buyers or something like a WeWork offers a membership where it's it acts almost like a co-op that you buy into. You pay a certain fee on on average. And now you can actually fractionally own part of the building that you're going to be in. 
and you could sell it at any point in time that you wanted to on an open free marketplace that's totally transparent. Um, it would be really nice. I imagine a lot of uh, real estate people would uh, love to have the unit economics of a, of a digital marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that could very well happen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because everyone everyone becomes an investor, basically. You get 8 billion investors and then all of our clones that Will's talking about uh, that AI is running. So maybe you have 80 billion investors. If you have questions, go ahead and drop your questions in the Q&A and uh, we'll spend some time towards the end getting to some of those. Uh, Greg, you were going to say something? No, I, I was just saying, I think that's Adam Newman's new business called Flow, uh, the apartment time co oh, yeah. model that's uh, that's just beginning and raised all that money from uh, A16Z. Yeah, of course he's doing that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're, you already see it in uh, co-working spaces, uh, in bars. I know um, Yuga Labs was working with a bar in New York, I believe. You might have to fact check me on this, but I believe they're working at the bar in New York where they developed a uh, NFT that you had to own. That was, your, that was your in to the bar. And so now the bar is exclusive to people who own an NFT that gets them in. And the cost has shot now into the... So that last time I saw, it was like $300,000 to own one of these NFTs that gets you into this bar. So it becomes this really exclusive access, right? Uh, which you could say, you know, perpetuates uh, inequities and things of that sort. And it probably does. Uh, but it's also a very interesting experimental use case in how do you monetize uh, access to place? Um, I think that's an interesting question. And not that all places should be or need to be monetized necessarily, but as developers are looking for new business models to remain viable and the emerging kind of the competitive pressures that they're going to see coming from these kind of collective communities of people who are crowdfunding uh, this, you know, the, the new ownership models. Um, these are things to be thinking about, right, as you're as you're evolving. So. I've got a I've got another example that's probably even more pragmatic. Um, we uh, at Prota uh, we incubated and invested in a company called uh, Votegrity, and what Votegrity does is uh, for like a huge condo board or any kind of like building governance that happens, uh, it's a centralized place to be able to vote and to be able to uh, demonstrate. You're able to look up to make sure that your vote using the same kind of encryption technology to make sure your vote counted in the way that you meant it to to happen. Right now, a lot of that stuff's happening in, in HOA meetings where like people are filling out paperwork and then sending it to somebody and they're putting it in Excel. Like decision making uh, can move so much faster when you remove the friction. And I can only imagine what a headache and how many layers of bureaucracy and and decision making that has to happen in large buildings. Um, and uh, I think that's a, a way right away that folks could find uh, to get into this space. Any questions? Uh, I mean, Harold, I'm sure you've got a question. Jake, I see you. Who else is here? Uh, Sid, Teak, Allison, Carolina. I know you all have good questions, question asking abilities. Um, nice comment about mitigating homelessness through these new paradigms um, based on you know the conversation you were having Joel is is quite interesting how do we set up these systems to address those most in need in society like you're starting to, to lean on as something near to me be on the board of a, a homelessness um, you know housing organization here in San Francisco um, and some of the special projects that we're doing like dignity moves in in the Bay Area um, you know, using land kind of on a fractional basis on a temporary uh, loan to pop up, um, you know, communities, temporary communities for those in transition from homelessness to being housed um, is, is a really important um, challenge for, for many of our urban environments. And, and using these kind of technologies and, and thought processes to start solving this is going to be um, really beneficial, uh, especially here on the West Coast, where we we see these issues in, in all of our major cities. Josh asked, in the realm of workplace, do you, any of you see digital experiences as improving face-to-face -face at the office? If so, what kinds are at the forefront and have the least friction to adopt? 
I love that question. Yeah, uh, yeah, I see that for sure. So, like uh, right now, at the in the building that I'm in, it's a creative, uh, it's a creative group, right? And what used to maybe take 50 people to like do, uh, oh, I'm going to do uh, character explorations, and then I'm going to pull in all these mood boards, and then that guy 3D mocks it up, and that lady does the sound. Well, now that we have AI that's doing a lot of this, we can actually just have one or two people working together in a in just a tiny room. And they can basically go to the AI. The AI does thousands of hours worth of work in a few seconds, brings it back. So we're almost like directors now. And we're co-collaborating something that would usually take like 50 uh, managers that would be managing small groups to be able to bring something back on a three-week basis. That really, at the moment, increases the, the feeling of, oh, we're accomplishing a lot. It's also terrifying because basically everybody who does this kind of work now knows oh, we, our business model is changing next month or <laughs> at best next year. And so um, in some ways it's making it feel really nice. I'm sure it's like the first person that was able to have like a steam shovel instead of like a uh, shovel gang going on. Uh, but things are changing really fast. So enjoy it. Enjoy the change, I guess, because it's happening. <laughs> yeah. I mean, about five years ago, we started experimenting with Alexa's and using Alexa to record meetings and automate our notes for us. And just in five years, the amount of uh, advancement we've seen in computational note taking and synthesis has been ridiculous, right? And if, if anyone is a copywriter, or if like me, you're a researcher, and you, a lot of your job is to write about things, uh, you should be scared to some degree, but also you should learn how to leverage those tools to accelerate and optimize the work that you do. And so I think in a face-to-face -face environment, uh, what I would love to see happen is if I'm discussing, uh, for example, this conversation, we could take, if this was a face-to-face -face conversation and we captured the conversation uh, digitally, and now you have computational ability uh, through things like JetGPT and others to literally come through and highlight the main points of the conversation. What's the high level synthesis? What are the actions that can be taken based on your particular archetype or persona coming out of that conversation? And uh, what happens next in terms of follow-ups and scheduling? All of that can be automated, right? And it, it already is in a lot of ways. Um, so it, it could be interesting to see things like conversation synthesis happening in real time in front right. of you right um that would be you know really cool and I, again i think i think there are startups i've seen starting to do this work so that's one example um let's see any other questions we got a couple okay cool people showing up allison what elements of iot and connectivity do you think we'll look back on in 10 years and laugh about what do you think is a passing fad versus trend with staying power and useful application What do you guys think? I, I think that, yeah, go, go for it, Mike. I think that right now thinking 10 years in the future is going to look anything like today is just wild. I mean, like uh, we, we're at the precipice of every single thing changing in unpredictable ways and all the three bodies problems involved with that. Um, and so I don't think we're actually going to look back and laugh as much as like we are going to become more like gods in some way and uh and we're gonna have superpowers that we have no idea how to even explain today i think everything is going to feel like like a cell moving to being a full like creature right like we are the cell right now and we're about to become something totally different just go spend a few hours trying to do whatever you're the world's expert at with chat gpt or if you're a great artist with stable diffusion and you'll see like oh, these machines have now passed us in any specific thing and they're starting to talk. Yeah. And they're still derivative to some degree of what's been done already. That's the fundamental model that they're built on. It's something that has already existed. So thinking about how to create new value and new things, leveraging these tools, like how do you extrapolate instead of do something more derivative? I think it's a, a, just a... a I don't know. It's a mindset. I think that does need to be adopted in all of this. Yeah. Think about this optimistically. Think about 
the enablement that this provides us. This gets us out of the weeds of our daily grind and closer to the source of your creativity, of your passion to be able to make a better impact on the world. You know, like like look at the world through that that kind of lens and framework, um, because this is a, a, the ability to do so much more and and get out of the repetition and and into that raw creativity to imagine a better world and and have the tools to build it. Um, because if we only rely on AI, it's going to be a reversion to the mean. You know, we are just going to get that. Exactly. You know, the, the fully like the middle view of everything. We cannot allow ourselves as a species to do that. We still need to inject the funkiness that is humankind into this equation. It's not just an algorithm, but let that be the the tool that, like Mike is saying to, or or uh, Will, um, you know, how do we be exponential as people and have massive impact? Um, this is this is more for all of us. This is bringing everybody, um, you know, to the same you know, playing field and, and allowing creativity, idea, and the power of, of our ability to dream together um, to flourish. That, that's where all this is leading us to. Um, this is not limiting and just getting us out of jobs that no one really wants anyway. Um, it's really about kind of focusing on a whole new crop of jobs. You know, yes, the steam shovel replaced a lot of, you know, people digging ditches, um, but that allowed us to, you know, move on to different kind of automation um, and, and different kind of jobs and different levels of service and experiences. Um, so this is more for everybody uh, in my point of view. Yeah, some really great questions in here. I mean, they're the same way when I learned how to write code like 25 years ago and started building web products that kind of made me money while I, while I was asleep. Now there's a whole community of people applying that um, same principle using Web3 and other technologies around social impact, right? What can we do to help uh, provide foundations so that individual societies around the world will have the tools to be able to identify their own local problems? And then there's resources and other types of uh, creative solutions to allow them to be able to uh, flourish in their own in their own way. So I think in innovative. Uh, um, uses of, of AI to be able to give a foundation for others to be able to be, meet at least at, to start basic Maslow hierarchy of needs things, right? Food, water, education, shelter, et cetera. Um, I think that's, that's, the, that's where we're heading. So right now to sort of answer the previous question, right now we're making tools and products equivalent to like saddles on a horse or, or you know, how to like, you know, beautify the horse or put horseshoes on or whatever. Um, but the, 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 all the different other modes of technology are coming, right? People are going to start making products for my digital twins across all those metaverses that I talked about, right? And I'm going to be buying for, uh, uh, for basically enhancing those experiences of my virtual selves. I just hope my call to action for the people out there is to think about entrepreneurship in the way I just mentioned in terms of social impact. Like what can we do to help each other lift, lift each other up? And if the more of us that are thinking that way, applying all these technologies, uh, the better. Yeah, I love that. I want to extend that theme just a little bit more and and uh, talk about this question that Dave uh, asked. And this will land. We'll land it here. We'll close on this. In this world where anything can be made, remade, reimagined, what do you hold on to as durable, persistent, or necessary? I've got mine. Go for it. It's the present moment. Mm. Because the future is totally out of our control and accelerating and the past already happened. And, um, and I think a lot of it is going to be about finding contentedness, not having our identity uh, in what was also not fearing as much what's in the future. Like, like we have to have hope and we have to like what Will was talking about, weave the social fabric because the fabric isn't there yet. So we have to do it with all the people in every network that we're around. I love that. Yeah. There's something about the, I always talk about the last 30 years that technology has been doing its thing. If someone could replicate the experience of a long leisurely meal with another human, you know, where you're just meandering through conversation, 
those types of experience, kind of piggybacking on what Mike just said, those are not those are not going to be going away. If anything, the questions around how can technology help us get more of those IRL experiences to connect deeply with humans and just, yeah, I just think about like my interactions with my children, those, those experiences, the deep, deep multifaceted emotional centers that get uh, activated when I'm, when I'm having those types of, those types of experiences, uh, those, I just think more and more of our technology across work and life and everything and play is just going to, it should help help us help each other and then help us capture those those most meaningful relationships and experiences that we have. Yeah, awesome. So we're gonna land it there. I love that. Thank you guys so much. Um, real quick, Mike and Will, where can people find you? If they want to follow up? Uh, you can find me at Mikey Anderson on Twitter or on LinkedIn. You can just search Mike Anderson Prota. Great. Will? Yeah, I'm. I'm- WC Little on on Twitter uh, and LinkedIn as well. I'm basically WC Little on on most of the socials. Okay, great. Greg and I at Ginsler, you know where to find us. I dropped my email in the chat. I don't know if you can see it or not, but it's there. Uh, Thank you all for coming and uh, playing along, exploring this topic with us. Let us know what you think, what it provoked, and um, where you're going next. All right. Thanks, all. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Joel. Thanks for having us. Thanks for coming. All right, a couple quick things before you go. Number one, I have a general newsletter where I write about technology and startups and health science and teaching people to code. And I write about a variety of different subjects that we talk about on this show. So if you go to wclittle.com, there you'll be able to subscribe and you'll also be able to subscribe to particular topics. If you're just interested in one or a few of them, you'll be notified right when I publish new content in those areas. Number two, my partners and I at Proto Ventures have a portfolio company called Startup Rocket. If you go to startuprocket.com, there you'll be able to receive coaching guides and customize an operations framework for you and your team and your advisors to be on the same page in terms of what is the appropriate next step for you in your entrepreneurial journey. And finally, if you wouldn't mind leaving a review anywhere that you have listened to this podcast or watched this podcast, it'd be super helpful to help those who might be interested in consuming this content as well. Thank you.